Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. Today is Thursday, February 22nd. This is host Richard Benuli. Today we have returning guest Charles Hugh Smith. Charles is author, leading global finance blogger, and America's philosopher, we call him. He's the author of several books on our economy and society, and two I'd like to point out that relevant to uh, our discussion today. One is called A Radically Beneficial World, Automation, Technology, and Creating Jobs for All. And the second is Will You Be Richer or Poorer? And so today would like to uh, continue in our vision series of uh, systems that uh, are, are coming to uh, either fruition or maturity or that make sense uh, in, in the new era that we're looking for, uh, perhaps beginning in the 2032 timeframe, look, looking positively uh, to, to when things um, may, may get better. And... Uh, so to today's topic, we'd like to discuss and focus on artificial intelligence and how, how uh, th that relates to jobs. Uh, is, is it a threat to jobs? A lot of people are worried. Or is it um, uh, some kind of, a, of, an, of an aid that will help, a productivity tool that will help um, in, in some way? So we'd like to explore that and... Uh, um, so yeah, Charles, uh, welcome uh, back to the program show, and uh, just thought we'd begin with some of your blog writing, some of the recent writings that you have been doing a focus on in in this space. If you want to uh, elaborate, yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, the, uh, the the our conversation today uh, was sparked by a, a, an email from a reader of of my book, uh, Get a Job and build a real career, which is already about 10 years old. But even back then I was uh, writing the book with an express purpose to um, provide some guidelines about how to have a career in, in the emerging economy, which, which by that I meant um, the economy that we have uh, today, not the one we wish we had or the one from the past, which includes a globalization and globalized technology, globalized finance and uh, global competition from the entire workforce. <laughs> so it, those are all realities that, um, uh, you know, North American workers and, and all workers around the world have to have to deal with. And so I, um, I've thought a lot about AI um, in, in, in terms of applications. And I actually started my interest in AI back in the, in the 80s when there was the first wave of, of what we would call now as machine learning. And of course, um, it's advanced uh, considerably and since then, and now we have um, these large language models and chat GDP and, um, and uh, huge uh, data harvesting capabilities. And, and, and that, of course, has boosted machine learning. So I just want to start out by making a few points and then I'll ask you, um, and you've done your own studies. And, and um, so what I notice and what other people are saying is that large language models are essentially natural language interfaces. So like in the good old days, we'd have a blinking command prompt. <laughs> you know, that was our interface with, with the technology, right? Was you had a command prompt and then you typed yeah. in some, some, some code or scripts. So this is a very powerful thing that, that computers can now talk to us in the language that we use and know. But the fact that they can speak like a human being and, um, doesn't mean that they're actually intelligent. It, it's, it's an interface, not, it doesn't mean they're intelligent. So we have to be careful not to over uh, emphasize you know, the intelligence just because they can speak in natural language. The other thing is that they uh, are fundamentally a data harvesting, uh, data harvesting approach to intelligence in other words they're going to generate they're going to scoop data in, in the in hundreds of millions of records and draw inferences from that large database that would not be possible from smaller databases and so um this is the kind of fuel of machine learning right 
and and there's there's other technologies in here so i i'm not uh, claiming that i'm not this i am simplifying things um but this is sort of the 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 foundations of the technology that we're we're discussing today as it applies to replacing human work right huge database um harvesting and which then generates um what we would call algorithms or conclusions that have a, a, a solid foundation in the sense of coming from a very large database. But the flaws in this, um, and, and so we can see the benefits, but we, we have to mention the flaws. One of the flaws is it creates an illusion of, of what I call false precision. In other words, if you've said, well, we've, we've scanned 100 million records and 95% of the time, this, this um, uh, program that scans, um, say, uh, human uh, skin variations for melanoma cancers is 95% accurate. And so then you go, well, that's really a very high accuracy rate. And so, but, but the problem is, is that 5% or whatever that number is, because if you are a person who's having your, you know, some uh, tumor or potential tumor scanned and then, and there's no human to check whether the, the, uh, the program diagnostics were, were, are actually correct or align with the human's experience, then you could be misdiagnosed by this um, machine learning. And so there's a lot of that potential for false precision where we we're told this thing is, is really highly um, accurate, but it's like the error rate is, is really difficult to assess. And um, as you and I, as Richard and I were speaking before the program, there can be misinformation either intentionally or unintentionally that um, can sort of pollute the, the, the data. So how do we deal with that imprecision that's built into these models? And so Richard, maybe you can talk about, you know, that, that, that problem of, of false precision or what do you do uh, with the, the, the unknowns that still exist? Yeah, that, those are great points, Charles. And, so essentially, you, you're going to still need a human at some point. Um, and very um, importantly, at, at the end, like some kind of output from the from the um, the LLM or um, the maybe it's a source code or some output of data. It needs to be assessed by some type of human. So that alone right there is a, is a job so that that could be a, like a formalized job in, in the sense of um, paid employment. Um, so that's one area for anybody looking for for employment. But um, importantly, uh, that the, the role of that is to assess the accuracy uh, of the data or, or the source code. So if the LLM is being used to generate source code, the idea is you want to be able to to uh, look at the source code that's been generated automatically and assess if it's valid, if it meets all, all the requirements, maybe there's some requirements it doesn't meet or it's, it's, it's flawed in some ways. Um, so the, the human would be involved in some type of QA, quality assurance testing activities uh, in, in that sense. So that there's, there's work to be done uh, on that way. But uh, to your point earlier as well, in terms of the false precision, um, the idea that, that uh, somebody could intentionally put in false data, uh, you know, so maybe I think you brought up the example uh, before we started our, our discussion on, on um, like rewriting history. Somebody could put in uh, a different version of history that is not accurate. And... Um, Maybe one of the fact checkers comes and uses that LLM, the chat GBT, and says, hey, I, I checked it. it. The chat GBT, the LLM gave me this output. So therefore, it must be accurate. But but no, it, what happened is somebody put in that, that false history and uh, essentially garbage in, garbage out. Um, and it, it could be anything. It could be, um, you know, also it could be sort of unintentional in the sense that uh, maybe somebody is doing some some research and they're trying to find out about something, but they don't put in um, an accurate mapping of something to something. They're just trying to check if that if that mapping exists 
or that correlation exists. Uh, and by just the very fact of asking that question, that data goes into the into the database, uh, in, into the data um, warehouse, if you will, of, of the LLM. And eventually, later, somebody will 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 um, get that as an output. So, is that accurate? No. I mean, it was just somebody's question, or they they were thinking there was a link with something else, but there isn't. So, there, there's all kinds of scenarios on this that just necessitate the the need for for a human uh, to to intervene to either look it over do some testing Q, qa assess if it's accurate or not um and and the assessment process is quite complex right from a human um it, it could bring into disciplines uh, that are multidisciplinary across different areas like legal uh, regulatory compliance, maybe some IT knowledge. Um, so that's that's hard to to do, right? Um, but but I mean, there are advantages. There there are positives to this, um, and it's it's more of a, a tool for productivity, and it's more of a, of an aid that that can help in in doing you know whatever you're doing in terms of jobs. Um, Charles, you mentioned you see it more involved in the service sector, right? Rather than sort of physical uh, part of the economy. Yeah. The, um, yeah. And I think you're right in, in calling it a tool and, and suggesting what we're suggesting is humans are still the error correction uh, <laughs> element of, of this technology. And as you say, that can require basically um, a physician level uh, skill and experience to, to review um, the conclusions of pathology or, or diagnoses recommending surgery. I mean, there's just a lot of different things that you would want. If you're the patient, if you're the corporate um, manager, then you, you may want to minimize that human error code, um, error correction. But if you're the patient, you want a, uh, an experienced physician to be reviewing the diagnosis from you know, um, the program. <laughs> or the, the data set. So there's that. And then um, we have to, I think it's, it's like where we're, where we are experiencing um, chat AI and, and bots already is in the service sector. For instance, customer service, like now you um, you're, you're told to download an app, which is basically a AI aid, if you will, to help you solve any problems you have with your internet gateway. For instance, your internet service is down, you know, so you're supposed to go through the app and then the app is there to help you. And so this, this is the kind of interface we're experiencing where it's natural language and you, you, you check a, you have a menu and, and so on. But I found that these, um, in things having to do with like the internet, um, the, uh, the chat, um, the, the AI bot is telling me my gateway is working perfectly and it's still down. And so I need to speak to a human rep who then immediately sees what's, what's wrong. And the same kind of thing in, in tax preparation problems. I've, I've asked a number of questions regarding um, issues in like the U S tax code. I was, just as a person who's got to do my own taxes. Right. And the answers are either wrong or they're half right or they missed the point. And so there's obviously a, a, a need for humans to um, clean up the, 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 the and, and improve, you know, the problem solving abilities of this technology, you know, and, and there's always new problems. So it's not like we're going to be able to just write uh, one AI uh, bot code and it's going to answer all questions forever. It's like, no, the tax code's constantly changing human health um, issues are constantly being updated and so on and so forth. So there's certainly going to be an industry in, in, in making these technologies more accurate and keeping them current to, to uh, general changes in, in the economy. The other point is, uh, as you say, about uh, the, the real world, like, okay, so something's wrong with your car. Well, in, in modern cars, they're like hugely uh, controlled by software, as we all know. So there's a, uh, there's, uh, usually a, an input device where you can put in a, um, a basically a computer and then the software in the car will report to you what error code 
um, is it's found so that you can identify the problem and fix it. So then if you look at these um, like large data sets and, and you go, well, they might give me a um, probability of what the likely problem will be. But the reality is I need to actually plug it into this particular car to find out what's wrong with this car. So in that sense, if there's a human who's going to be using um, AI tools but uh, as part of the job, but ultimately the, the, the AI, you know, database or, or uh, software interface is, is not going to be able to put the car on the rack, jack it up, and then do whatever it needs to fix it. So in, in, in other words, there's just a lot of real world stuff that, um, that these AI tools may, may help in diagnosing the problem, but the work is still going to have to be done by a human being. Yeah, absolutely. And even then there's a lot of minefields. Um, there's, there's, um, some issues regarding the ownership of the generated data that really need to be considered. In fact, there's been some, some lawsuits already in this regard. And, and that revolves around um, there. There could be situations where there's licensing of of information, um, and 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 therefore there could be license violations. Uh, actually, recently you've had a, a lawsuit uh, from Get Getty Images suing Stability, the the company behind Stable Diffusion Image Generation Tool. Uh, um, for, for alleged license violations. Uh, so that, you know, that, that's, that's one example, but, um, b basically the idea of generating code as well, uh, with, so somewhere in the, in the LLM, there could be the use of that code. It's, and it's hard to identify where that came from. So, uh, giving attribution in terms of reference, uh, to, to where the data came from, um, and, and which could be owned in terms of a, of an intellectual property right, so that there's issues there that that need to be uh, considered. So a lot of minefields. I mean, you you there could be uh, lawsuits coming out of this in, in many different types of scenarios. Yeah, that's an excellent point, um, Richard. And um, so there there may be an ongoing uh, intellectual property uh, industry relating to these these issues because they're very difficult to ascertain the right and wrong in it and so uh, these are thorny legal issues um, another thing that I, I spoke of uh, in my book is that there's uh, there's several kinds of value created right by, by work and one way we differentiate these different kinds of value is is we call it uh, high touch and and low touch and so high touch is where you go to you know and there's a physician or a nurse who's going to speak to you and actually examine you and and talk with you about your your health issues and so on or you go to a a bistro and there's a um there's a sir uh you know a, a wait staff who's knowledgeable and then there's a a, a wine sommelier and you know these are these are very valuable to humans and that we can actually look at sociological studies that identify the number of human contacts we have with, with people who we don't really know them well. They're not friends, but they're social contacts. And they can, and, and so it turns out that we're, we're much happier as human beings if we have more of these contacts than if we're isolated and we don't have any of those um, sort of superficial but still meaningful interactions with other humans so if everything is done by uh, software or robot um, we actually end up becoming less happy because that's like a real low touch kind of existence and i'm already hearing a lot of stories from other people where you know every phone call to try to solve a problem ends, ends up in some kind of um you know uh form of Kafka-esque um, runaround where the problems don't get solved, but you're referred to somebody else or some other office or there's, you know, so there's a, um, there's a cost to relying on data and, and AI to solve problems 
when they're not, it's not really intelligent. You know, in other words, human problem solving, as, as you mentioned earlier, crosses a lot of, um, can cross a, a lot of uh, bar uh, barriers, if you will, and, and, and break down the silos, you know, because typically if you're going to be problem solving within a narrow field, you're creating a silo. And so the program or the robot even is, is not going to be able to recognize other conditions or factors outside of the, the field that it's been trained in. You know, machine learning. So this cross-disciplinary problem solving, I think, is going to be the core uh, skill going forward. And that AI will generate tools for people that problems problem solve. But you know, the the world is dynamic, and it's an open system. You know, in other words, the world of AI is is ultimately a closed system. It gathers data from the open system of the real world, but it becomes a closed system. You know, it, and so the real world is open and dynamic. And so there's going to be a constant flow of, of situations that are going to require more problem solving. So I think that, and, and you can say that at some level, everybody that's doing any kind of work now is, is problem solving. Right. And so AI can, can leverage certain, you know, knowledge fields, but ultimately there's still going to be work that has to be done on a particular car uh, uh, to, uh, consult with a particular human being, prepare a meal for a particular group of people. I mean, on and on, repair a um, rotted railing in a particular building. And all of those things are still going to have to be done by human beings. And all of them, those uh, many of these situations are not, cannot be routinized. You know, they can't be reduced to some like script, you know, that they actually involve a variety of skills and it's probably still going to be cheaper to hire a human uh, for, for most of this kind of work. And so I see, like, I think your point about the work could become more meaningful because you're allowed to do more with the routine work handled by these AI tools. But, but in the real world, they're going to be just tools to help the human do the, their core function, which is problem solving. Yeah, absolutely not. And the same fears that we had when when software engineering, software programs came into the world, you know, maybe over the last uh, 40, 50 years or so, um, there was fear that, would, you know, these softwares are going to take over everybody's jobs, but, uh, but they didn't, right? And it basically helps uh, as a productivity tool, as a job aid and uh, can do certain repetitive tasks you know quicker faster um and and allow uh, releasing of time for for people to work on other other areas of work uh, or problems uh and also work that might be more more meaningful instead of doing continuous repetitive tasks that might be boring so there's there's, there's benefit there um the, the other area that is going to be very beneficial is uh, to organizations is overall uh, operational cost savings uh, because things can be done, you know, a little bit cheaper uh, in some cases, you know, w without um, uh, human uh, uh, involvement. So, so some of it can be programmers, as mentioned. Um, so in some cases, it'll, it'll be a lower cost. Um, and Along with that, if, if you are able to do a business process uh, optimization, business process transformation for any organization, you know, if you think of a company that, that does several business processes, if you analyze those business processes and you make them more efficient, um, actually, you're not only saving on the operational cost, but... Um, the idea of uh, be, because it's a simpler process uh, that that is now mechanized, you've actually lowered the you know energy usage, uh, perhaps also even carbon emissions. You could go to that point. You know, carbon emissions is lower, so you're you're saving cost and lowering carbon emissions, lowering energy usage at the same time. Yeah, that's right. In terms of, of efficiencies, there is uh, uh, certainly huge potential. And then 
sort of on the other side of that, uh, we have to mention, you know, like this, these are supposed to be forms of intelligence, right? I mean, ultimately limited, but still there's, they're, they're um, supposed to be intelligent, not just uh, scripts that are running. And so when we look at the problems that we're, we're dealing with globally, uh, for instance, high inflation, um, the decline of nutritional value in the food, um, what I call the wastest growth economy, you know, where we become uh, overly dependent on planned obsolescence and uh, fast product cycles, uh, the explosive rise of debt, um, the, you know, the, the proliferation of global conflicts. I mean, these are the big problems. And so, uh, you know, in, in uh, science fiction, then, then AI would be theoretically somehow able to help us solve these big problems. And so I mentioned this just to point out that it actually is rather limited. We, we're not turning to these uh, chatbots to solve these global problems. We're simply trying to make um, the service industry to, and production uh, more efficient. And, and, and that's pretty much all we can do with this technology. You know, it's not going to it's not going to revolutionize human civilization in the sense of replacing human problem solving. So, um, and, and again, my, my last point I would make is, I think one of the ironies of this is going to be that as, as AI automates a lot of the service sector, uh, that's actually going to increase the value of the high touch human experiences that 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 um as i say that we are inherently drawn to so they'll they'll still be uh, a great demand or maybe even an increasing demand for that that kind of high touch human interactions um as everything else gets automated so there there there'll be a, a place for humans who are simply um friendly smiling helpful you know they, they won't need to be geniuses they'll simply be uh, providing us with that human touch that we still value. Yeah, exactly. And so the the advice uh, could we come up with some pointers for advice to people either uh, relating to jobs or 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 doing risk management on, on um, um, you know ma managing the risks associated with with the use. Uh, which which could have legal implications, you know, in terms of regulations and uh, and, and violations. Y your thoughts on that, Charles? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great um, ending question, Richard. Is um, it 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 turns out this reader uh, was a young woman who had um, gone to college and and wanted to change careers, and so she ended up in software. And she said that most of what she's gained was either community learning or on her own. And so I think this, this tells us a lot of the potential for AI, which is as a learning tool for everybody. Like maybe you don't need to go uh, to college for four years, <laughs> or if you've already done that and, and, and you're still at loose ends, then um, you, you're, you're, uh, a lot of these tools and the software that they generate are, make learning easier and, and more accessible so that you can enter a new field or gather new skills uh, more easily on your own. And I think that that will be a huge benefit in and of itself. And then I think that the main advice I would have for anyone is to remain uh, flexible and, and always, and to realize that you, we all have to keep learning. And so to the best of our abilities, uh, acquire familiarity with all, with all new technologies, including, LLMs and machine learning, but always consider what else we can do with that as opposed to not allowing ourselves to be um, boxed into some position where we can be replaced. So it's, it's more like looking at these as tools to leverage in our own growth of, of knowledge and ability and problem solving. So that, that's, that may sound vague, but um, I think that's, that's the future of work and meaningful yeah. work. Mm -hmm. And my, my advice would be to think outside the box and to to use it as a tool 
for for applications in in work. So it could be this anything service sector anything. Um, what one application in particular comes uh, relating to this platform that we're talking on now on Zoom, whereby the the AI next generation of Zoom will be an application that essentially translates real time uh, on on English, like we're, we're talking in English now, but it translates in real time English into say Chinese, right? So that somebody in China would be listening to our discussion uh, perhaps real time or, or when it's published, uh, they would be hearing Chinese only, you know, from our discussion. Um, so that this is also making use of, of AI technology. So, so that would be one example, but the advice would be to think outside the box, use, make use of it in a tool to offer a new product, a new service, or an enhancement of an existing service, uh, making an existing service more efficient, you know, so all kinds of scenarios like that in, in the area of work so that uh, you can basically create jobs for yourself you, using AI a, as the tool. And, and secondly, um, my advice would also be on the um, legal and regulatory uh, area to be very uh, mindful um, and to review uh, like third-party service agreements with with the AI in mind, you know, have your legal team review your contracts, agreements um, to determine how, how the AI tool it could impact the safety of your data. So, um, you know, this would be like potentially including provisions that limit um, what's called fourth-party risk, such as when a third-party service transmits your data to uh, a, to an AI tool. And um, the other thing would be regulatory compliance, contractual agreements involving data usage, you know, to have your legal team um, review that. Um, how, how can, how could your data be used or, and, you know, as a input into downstream, whoever's using it, but also how you're using the data from the AI. AI tool as an as an output to you, so there, there could be some legal problems there. As I mentioned earlier, the um, the fact of the um, the licensing and intellectual property risks. So you know you need to take a look at that. So that that would be my advice in those areas. That's that's great, Richard. I really like what you uh, concluded in that. Uh, ultimately, these these tools enable us to create our own jobs. Well, it's been a great discussion, uh, Charles. This this is a very interesting topic. It's quite fluid. There's a lot happening uh, in the AI world, but um, lo lots of potential good for for society, and uh, can, can be used as a tool for for um, creating new jobs. Yes, well said. Okay, well, thank you so much for um, uh, hosting our discussion on uh, AI and, and human work and value. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.